All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Liu. I'm the director of Center for Environmental Law here at Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to attend our center's uh, 20, 2021 annual lecture by Her Excellency uh, Elizabeth Marema, the uh, Secretary General, as uh, a Secretary General of the of the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the uh, of the Macquarie traditional owner of the Macquarie University land, the Watamataga clan of the Darwin Nation, and pay my respect to uh, the elders, past, present, and future. Uh, so before we uh, before we uh, kick off, let's do the welcome to the country. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. All right. So now let me uh, please introduce uh, Professor Liz Berry, a dean of the Macquarie Law School at Macquarie University, uh, to deliver her uh, welcome uh, speech. Please, Liz. Thank you very much, Ningye. It's my very great privilege to welcome you all this morning to Macquarie Law School and the annual lecture of the Centre for Environmental Law. Ms. Elizabeth Memory. Executive Secretary of the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Honourable Justice Preston, Chief Justice of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, members of the Centre Advisory Board, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, welcome. Although we wish you could join us in person, the past two years have served as a stark reminder of how we must face health, environmental and biodiversity challenges together and we're grateful that you can join us virtually today. This lecture continues a valued tradition of the Centre for Environmental Law. With Ms. Murma, following previous year's speakers, Chief Justice Brian Preston, the Honourable Rob Stokes MP, Professor Leslie Hughes, Senator Maureen Faruqi, and Jane Goodall. Macquarie University has a strong history of involvement in environmental law. Established in 1983, the Centre is Australia's oldest continually functioning environmental law centre. The Centre has nurtured leaders of Australia's environmentalism campaign, including prominent alumni such as Justice Preston and Robert Stokes, New South Wales Minister of Planning. Under the leadership of Associate Professor Neng Ye Lu, the Centre is entering a new phase with a mission to drive transformative change through interdisciplinary legal research that provides solutions to the global challenges of biodiversity loss and extinction risk. The centre aims to become a leading hub for biodiversity law and governance globally and forms an important part of the law school's strategic plan. Over the past year, the centre has produced many excellent publications including Dr. Michelle Lim's article, Extinction Hidden in Plain Sight, Can Stories of the Last Unearthed Environmental Laws Unspeakable Truth, 
published in the Griffith Law Review and announced as the recent winner of the Law and Society Association of Australia and New Zealand Publication Prize for 2021. The centre has attracted external grants from funding bodies such as the Australia Research Council and new HDR students have joined us from Australia, Sri Lanka and China. It's hosted successful events, including the Law and Nature Dialogues monthly webinar series and a conference in July, the Global Dialogue on Biodiversity, Law and Governance. We look forward to the continued growth of the centre over the coming years and to continuing this excellent tradition of the annual lecture. I wish to thank all those in attendance today for supporting this event on a topic of global and contemporary importance. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over the proceedings to Chief, sorry, to Chief Justice Preston to introduce our distinguished guest. Well, thank you very much. It's it, with great pleasure uh, that I uh, can introduce uh, Elizabeth Remmer. She is the Executive Secretary of the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity. Uh, she has worked uh, before that uh, with UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme, for over two decades, uh, concluding as the Director of the Law Division. And prior to joining the Law Division in June 2014, she was the Deputy Director of the Ecosystems Division in charge of the coordination, operations and program delivery from 2012 and also for one year served as acting director of that division. In 2021, so this year, uh, the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, uh, in collaboration with uh, UNEP, awarded Ms. Marema uh, the Nicholas Robinson Award for Excellence in Environmental Law in recognition of her dedication uh, in advancing uh, the environmental rule of law. Ms. Remmer has written and spoken extensively on the rule of law in protecting, conserving and restoring biodiversity, including advocating the importance of mainstreaming biodiversity into economic and political decision-making. She's recently discussed the mainstreaming of biodiversity in the post-COVID context, noting that the COVID-19 pandemic has served as a wake-up call to fix our deteriorating relationship with nature and has reaffirmed that biodiversity is fundamental for human health and critical for sustainable development. Her topic today is on mainstreaming biodiversity in the rule of law and the role of law. Uh, Ms. Marema, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to give the address this year. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Bren, and good to see you. Uh, indeed, the COVID has kept us away uh, from our usual meeting corners around the world. Uh, but my sincere thanks for the uh, invitation to talk to the distinguished participants across the globe on the important issues which uh, are facing us today. And actually, I've readjusted my topic a bit so as to make it as current as possible in terms of looking at biodiversity, how biodiversity is important or affects our health, and how then the current international environmental law actually considers the issue of biodiversity and health as very important to our survival. Sarah, if I could have the PowerPoint presentation projected, then I can proceed. Second slide. So <clears throat> it is my pleasure uh, to join you all. And uh, I would like first to introduce the biodiversity treaty regime uh, in a bigger context and then move from there to really be able first to underline why biodiversity is so important to human life and to the planet. And then move from there uh, in terms of looking at this period of the COVID, how and why biodiversity has become so important and how it has even affected us 
if what the scientists are telling us is true, could be part of the reason why we are not able to meet face to face and we're all uh, meeting now virtually, much as it helps in reducing our carbon print, but also we know uh, we have been forced to be indoors, not because we liked. And then complete the discussion with where environmental law specifically is uh, when we talk now of the uh, treaty regime, how the international treaties related to biodiversity have taken into account important issues uh, on health. When I talk of uh, biodiversity treaty regime, biodiversity convention on biological diversity with its two protocols is one, but we also have other biodiversity related conventions. And these are convention on international trade on endangered species of wild fauna and flora, CITES, convention on migratory species of wild animals, CMS, Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, the International Whaling Commission, uh, International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, and World Heritage Convention. And these, all these conventions actually form what we call Biodiversity Liaison Group. Why the group? The group meets regularly to be able to discuss common issues which cut across all these uh, international treaties. Uh, so that also our messages to the different parties at national level also align. And because biodiversity issues cut across, there is no boundary, then clearly we need to talk to each other and the countries at national level, particularly the national focal points of the different conventions need to be talking to each other so as to take actions for the implementation of the different treaties together and in commonality and avoid duplication, contradiction or conflict. Adding to that biodiversity regime, there is also what we call the Rio Conventions. These are the three conventions which were adopted in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And this is our convention on biological diversity, the Climate Change Convention, and the Convention to Combat Desertification. Again, together as secretariats, we form what we call joint liaison group, again, meeting regularly because again, the issues cut across. If you are following the climate COP, the last two weeks, which ended last uh, week on Saturday, you will have heard many times, in addition to climate change, loss of biodiversity, for deforestation, land use, land degradation, all these issues kept becoming over and over through different events, different commitments, different pledges. Clearly then that indicating the interconnection between climate change, loss of biodiversity and land degradation. That also means we cannot deal with climate change without looking at biodiversity loss and without looking at land degradation. Solutions to climate change will be also solutions to the other. Not surprising that today climate change is looking at nature, nature-based solutions as solutions to climate change. But where is nature? Biodiversity, the land, all right? Again, 37% of greenhouse gas emissions are expected to come from nature, from biodiversity to contribute to climate adaptation and mitigation. So you can see the interconnectedness of these issues and therefore we need to look at issues as a whole together. And unfortunately is today that we might be asking ourselves, how come then we have these many different treaties 1992, when they were negotiated, or when CITES, CMS were negotiated in the 1970s, probably what we are seeing today of the interconnectedness and the interlinkages had not been seen then. 
And therefore now we have to take these different steps to make sure that the actions are mainstreamed across the, across the society, across the whole of government in terms of all departments at government to uh, take actions together because whatever action will have an impact on social, economic uh, development as well as environmental uh, sphere. And this then explains that biodiversity is the foundation of life. Without biodiversity today, our lives will be uh, in jeopardy because the water we drink, the air we breathe, the jobs for the livelihood into the farms, fisheries, forests, and the like, as well as our livelihood, because that's where the food comes from, our health, because that's where the medicine, antibiotics come from. So we can see all these depends on biodiversity. And if they depend on biodiversity, will we survive without antibiotics? Will we survive without food, without drink, without the air we breathe? So really, biodiversity is the foundation of life. Unfortunately, the scientists are telling us, despite this importance, biodiversity is being lost at unprecedented rate in the history of humankind. Over a million species are feared going into extinction within this decade, this century. Over 75% of the land is already degraded. 85% of the wetlands are degraded. 66% uh, of the ocean is depleted. So really unprecedented rates on the situation of biodiversity, which then will impact not just our lives, but this is the lives of our children and our grandchildren and those not yet unborn, as Justice Brian will put it. Not surprising that today we are seeing the youth demonstrating across the globe, forcing governments to take action because they, we, are all, we are all in the same one earth, in the same planet. And they want to make sure we leave them with a planet which they can live on sustainably not a depleted, degraded planet. And we need to listen to their voices. So if I may shift directly into the Convention on Biological Diversity. The convention has, uh, the convention itself was adopted, as I said, in Rio, June 1992, entered into force a year later. But within the convention, there are two more protocols, which I will talk about, and one protocol has an additional protocol. And these three, four then compose the Convention on Biological Diversity Treaty Regime. The convention is universally applicable in the sense that it has been adopted virtually by all countries, by all UN member states, except one. United States is the only one not yet a party to the convention, but US participates in all our processes and actively engage in. So with that universal applicability, clearly then all countries have an obligation under the convention to implement and enforce it, to undertake measures indicated or inscribed into the, in the convention at national level uh, in terms which if all is done well, then we will not be talking of the unprecedented rate of biodiversity loss as IPBS report told us in 2019. IPBS is the intergovernmental uh, platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. The convention has three main objectives. Conservation of biological diversity, one. Sustainable use of its components, two. And fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the utilization of the genetic resources. So the last objective on fair and equitable sharing is, has also been further strengthened 
with its own protocol, which I will come to that. The convention has a number of provisions, but the key which underline the entire convention are two articles, one related to conservation in situ, namely really the process of protecting endangered species. And when I say endangered species, I mean animals and plants in their natural habitat. Ex situ is where species are relocated uh, to other places and being conserved there away from their natural habitat. This could be in the zoos, uh, or those are protected for research purposes and the like. But the convention also has all other provisions related to capacity building, uh, transfer of technology, financial mechanism to support particularly developing countries on the implementation of the convention. And we have the global environmental facility as the financial mechanism for the convention. And therefore we have that financial mechanism which enables the parties to it to actually play their role and ensure effective uh, implementation. Next slide. As I mentioned, the convention is complemented by two protocols. One is the Katagena protocol on biosafety. This has 173 parties. And the com but when we say biodiversity, this is basically it seeks to protect biological diversity from potentially risk, risks posed by li living modified organisms resulting from modern technology, which may have an adverse effect on the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. There have been theories currently which are saying probably COVID-19 was as a result of uh, uh, experiments in the lab. If this is proven true, this is where this protocol then comes in because it's that modern biotechnology in the lab uh, and those modified organisms which have been modified to give us something else and now which has posed these risks across the world. Let's hope that is not true, but if in future it is proven as some scientists allege, this is where the essence of this Katagena protocol on biosafety comes in. I mentioned the third objective of the convention, oh, sorry, the protocol because of the potential risks. And when we talk of potential risks, lawyers will always already think of, oh, what happens if there are damages? Where will the compensation be? It is that thinking that led into an additional uh, protocol to the biosafety on liability and redress to the biosafety protocol, which basically provides international rules and regulations uh, in the field of liability and readiness in the event there are uh, those living uh, modified organisms uh, from uh, modern technology, which may have affected the biological diversity. So that forms that regime of the Katagena Biosafety Protocol. The third uh, objective of the convention has led to the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. This is the latest protocol adopted uh, actually in 20, 10 years ago, entered into force a few years later with 131 parties into it. And this is basically, it provides again, rules and regulations on how uh, genetic resources can be accessed and accessed fairly, but then by doing so, how can the benefits be equitably shared with those producing those resources by those using those resources and vice versa. So that protocol is the one which regulates the fair and equitable sharing. This protocol, uh, which is under article 15 of the convention 
also complements Article 8J of the Convention, which specifically deals with traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge, because it is most cases the indigenous peoples and local communities with their culture and traditional knowledge who have been the best custodians and safeguards of conservation of biodiversity. So by doing so, how can they also first their knowledge be protected, their cultures be protected, and where resources are taken out, how then can the sharing of benefits accrue back to these communities for that safeguards uh, that we are able uh, to go there and access those genetic resources. So in summary, that gives uh, that uh, the, 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 the treaty regime uh, of the convention in a nutshell. Of course, both protocols have additional other uh, articles, uh, which some of them are repeating, capacity building, technology transfer, uh, financial mechanism, which is global GEF, global environmental facility, uh, setting up of national, uh, identifying national focal point, identifying national entity, which then can communicate with the secretariat and report to the other parties through the secretariat on actions being taken at national level for the implementation of specific protocol, as well as the convention. Next slide. Continue, 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 I will speak all of, yes. So what is the governance structure of the convention? The convention itself establishes a governance structure, a permanent governance structure. It establishes the conference of the parties, which meets once every two years, except the last two years because of the COVID situation. But so far it has met 14 times, including the last conference of the parties 2018 and the conference of the parties 15, which first part has been held a month ago and second part will be next year. I can talk about that uh, later. So the, the conference of the party's main function is to review the status of implementation of the convention by the parties. And it does so because the parties are obliged that every two years to produce what we call also under the convention national reports. And these national reports are submitted based on a particular template to the secretariat. The secretariat does an analysis and together submitted to the conference of the parties to be able to look at which areas need to be strengthened and which areas need to do otherwise. So every two years when the conference of the parties meet, it also adopts a number of decisions. These decisions, basically also one can say, further regulate the implementation of the convention. The convention also establishes the secretariat. And this is the body which I am privileged to lead uh, and is hosted by the government of Canada here in Montreal, where we are. And the secretariat then serves as that mechanism uh, of also uh, preparing for the conference of the parties, preparing the parties to fulfill their obligations, the channel of communication between the parties to the conference of the parties, uh, doing scientific assessment and technical assessment of the status of the implementation of the convention and the like. The convention has also established uh, a subsidiary body called SABSTA, subsidiary body on science, technical and technological advice, SABSTA. This body is established by the convention, but later through the decisions of the parties, they had also established another subsidiary body called subsidiary, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> <clears throat> called the subsidiary body of implementation. This was established later through the COP decision. 
the Conference of the Parties also regularly establishes other ad hoc groups, which basically are given a specific agenda item or terms of reference. And once they fulfill their task, then it is resolved. However, we have had two subsidiary bodies or two working groups which have become part of an institution within the, uh, uh, the work of the convention. Working group on Article 8J on traditional knowledge, which I mentioned, and the working group on protected areas. So these working groups were established by the <coughs> parties, but have been on for many years. Unlike where currently we have what is called ad hoc uh, open-ended working group on the development of post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This is the framework which is currently being developed to be adopted next year <coughs> at the second part of our COP. And it is the framework which will replace uh, the IH biodiversity targets which expired officially end of last year, although implementation continues. 10 years of implementation of the 20 IH biodiversity targets, unfortunately, none of the targets were fully met, although progress had been made to about six of them. There are reasons why that did not happen. And if time allows at the end, I can get uh, into that explaining that. So now for the last two years, <clears throat> this process through this working group under the two co-chairs from Canada and, Ke and, Kampala and Uganda has been leading the world, leading the parties in terms of developing a new framework. We have a draft framework, which, was which has been reviewed uh, in a virtual meeting in August, September, and then it will be reviewed or formal negotiations expected to ensue on that first draft in January, face-to-face -face meeting in Geneva. Again, it's a big process going on. If time allows, I can get into that. Both the convention, which I will also speak when I talk about the protocols, also establish clearinghouse mechanism. This is the mechanism where the parties uh, have a place where they can share uh, information, experience, they can put their national legislation, they can put their best practices so others can learn from that. So that is the clearinghouse mechanism managed uh, by the secretariat, but open for the parties to feed in the relevant information. Next slide. With the protocols, again, 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 yes. So I, I will only, the two protocols, with them, they have established what we call conference of the parties uh, serving as meetings of the parties. So normally we just call it meeting of the parties of the protocols. The functions, everything is just the same uh, with the convention, what I've talked below, but this now we'll be looking at each of the two specific protocols, because remember I mentioned each has its own parties. So those parties are the ones responsible and they're the ones forming the meeting of the parties. The same scientific body substance mentioned serves also as the scientific body for the uh, protocols, equally the scientific body, subsidiary body for implementation, clearing house mechanism, which I've referred for the convention and as the secretariat also serving as secretariat for the protocols. The only difference both protocols have what we call compliance committees. And compliance committees, these are committees which support, basically support countries which are in non-compliance with their obligations under the protocols. It could be uh, supporting in terms of financial resources and helping them to secure resources from the financial mechanism, the global environmental facility, it could be in terms of national reporting. It could be development of national uh, laws implementing the convention and the like. So that kind of assistance 
are discussed in the compliance committee, which reports in the uh, meetings of the parties and the meeting of the parties then take the specific decisions on how the non-compliant parties could be supported. Next slide. Now, I, with that highlights of the CBD or Convention on Biological Diversity Treaty Regime, which I've only touched in a nutshell, uh, I want now to shift squarely into the connection between biodiversity and our health or human health. And this shows how biodiversity is central. It is central for our health, whether we are talking of sustainable development, we are talking of uh, agricultural production, we are talking of disaster risk reduction, you are talking of air quality, water quality, agricultural biodiversity, our own mental health, uh, we are talking of uh, micro uh, biodiversity, all ecosystems, food and water, climate change, all these issues are biodiversity. And therefore, whether you are talking about water issues, air quality issues, climate issues, disaster risk reduction issues, it can be floods, uh, earthquakes, will all come back to biodiversity. And that shows the importance of biodiversity to human health. Next slide. Yes, I've mentioned about that, so we can continue. So what has been the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, biodiversity conservation? I don't need to speak much. I think we all know how devastating COVID-19 has been to the social, economic, environmental, developmental uh, 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 programs of each and every country in the world, including our own person of families. We have lost friends, we have lost relatives, uh, we are caring for the sick. I mean, I don't need to go into that. So together with the United Nations Environment Program, we have also looked at uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on the environment, on the food system, how to contain it, and how to build back better. So if we look at the negative aspects, as the result of COVID, many of the environmental management budgets had to be cut because of the urgency of resources to deal, to respond to the COVID situation. And this had affected many management, particularly wildlife management, because there had been no tourism, no trade, uh, protected areas where, uh, and the result has been increasing poaching in many wildlife uh, management areas because of that economic downturn. Scientists are telling us that COVID could also have been the result of uh, pathogens, uh, transmission of viruses from animals to human. Much as these uh, virus are not harmful to animals, but they are harmful to human. And then human to human through trade, tourism, travel, and the like, as the result of wild meat trafficking and the like. So if then we are suffering and it's true, and if it is finally later proven by what scientists are saying is true, you can imagine the impact of deforestation. We cut the tendons in the, because of industrial agriculture, for instance, big chunks of forest have been cut to create space for agriculture, to create space for animal husbandry. And this has led to human moving closer even to animals and thus interfering with the animal kingdom. We are paying the cost. As a result of that, even those local communities who were living with these animals in harmony for centuries, now they are losing their, their livelihood, their meat, because they are eat, having their meat, they are having their livelihood and living sustainably 
with these animals. But our selfish needs of wild meat or others have uh, interfered and affected this. And these then have led to shortages. It could be shortages of food because now we are all locked in, agricultural production affected, but also there's been a migration. In the past, we are concerned with migration of labor from uh, rural areas to urban centers. During COVID, it has been the other way around, from urban centers to the villages, particularly in developing world villages, because at least you say, I can get some food through a small garden behind, which is not there in the urban. Many people lost their jobs in the urban centers. They all ran to the rural areas. That has had an impact in the rural, uh, uh, for the rural communities, rural economic life and the like. And of course, uh, much as we are saying, uh, because there's been no travel, we have contributed into lessening our footprint. That is a positive aspect of it. But of course, the negative effects or effects also have been major. And all these, again, we are looking at biodiversity. It is the forest, it is the habitat destruction, it is the uh, increase in agricultural production, it is the infrastructure because it needs more timber from the forest. So all these have pushed us closer human beings to animals and we have interfered with the human animal kingdom and the whole world is paying the cost. Next slide. There have been also positive aspects. I don't think there is any time that awareness of biodiversity or the importance of biodiversity and nature has been understood than this the last two years. The convention was adopted almost 30 years ago, but it's only now that everybody is talking of nature, biodiversity, forest, X, Y, Z, and whatever. So the situation has increased the awareness and the importance of biodiversity because we have seen how it has affected each one of us, the whole world. We have seen with our naked eyes. So now we know its importance. And now we know that biodiversity is indeed the foundation of human life. It is the pillar for resilience inter intergenerational equity. In dealing with the COVID, we have also understood no one can, no solution can be obtained by one country alone. So global solidarity, international collaboration, international cooperation has become a cornerstone for solving any pro uh, environmental problem we are talking about, including the COVID including now talking of uh, the impacts uh, of our human activities on nature. The IPBS report has given us five primary drivers of biodiversity loss, all of which are affected by human action on biodiversity. It is the land and sea use change, it is climate change, it is pollution, it is over-exploitation of natural resources, it ev evasive alien species. It went on to provide also uh, secondary or indirect drivers, governance systems, infrastructure, population growth, rule of law, and the like. So all are as the result of human action. We can only get out of the COVID therefore, if only we take transformative actions to change our own behavior on how we treat nature. The latest report by Das Gupta, das Gupta Review report has told us, nature is no longer free to plunder. Nature has a cost because we have lived in a situation whereby nature has been taken as a free commodity and now, we are paying for that free commodity. Therefore, nature needs to be costed. World, environment, World Economic Forum has told us 
50% of the global GDP is dependent on nature. $44 trillion dependent on nature. By 2030, this same nature can provide up to 350 million new jobs, $10 trillion per year is accrued from biodiversity. And even we are seeing the private sector now assessing their risks uh, and, and the impacts and their dependencies on nature to be able to manage those impacts. So clearly biodiversity is important and it's important equally for our health, but nature can only take care of us if we take care of it. And nature is no longer free for all. But this situation of staying at home, it has even brought us closer to nature, that we have stayed indoors for too long, that we always wish, oh my goodness, where is the park nearby to just go and get fresh air? Haven't we felt that we need to get out, go under a tree, get the fresh breeze? So again, as people have stayed too long home, we have connected with nature. And the important and that awareness of combating changes in climate as part of biodiversity recovery. This is what we have also witnessed the last two weeks in Glasgow. So clearly, nature needs to be part and parcel of the green economic recovery post the COVID period. If, and uh, the scientists are telling us, if we are saying this is the worst COVID to them, we might end up with even a worse than what we have seen if our relationship, human action, human relationship with nature does not change. Clearly transformative actions are needed today, not tomorrow. Next slide. So the COVID situation and the pandemic has also affected our intergovernmental uh, governance processes. Just as now I'm talking to you and we're all participating in this event virtually, that has been the case also for our biodiversity processes and all many other uh, ongoing processes. I said, our conference of the parties meets once every two years. We have postponed twice our meetings of the parties because of the COVID. We managed to now divide our COP into two. The first one, which was pretty much more virtual uh, with a small part of hybrid a month ago in Kuming, China. And the next one in Kuming, China ought to be face to face next year. The good thing, and that's the positive aspect uh, uh, of the unfortunate situation of the COVID, it has given us and the parties, member states, governments, stakeholders, more time to prepare, particularly the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which I had mentioned earlier on. The, the way the draft appears now, which was launched in July last year, and which has already been reviewed through a number of virtual uh, meetings, probably will not be in these states if the conference of the party was held uh, two years ago. So more time to prepare, but more so, more time to consult all stakeholders. The co-chairs were instructed by the parties to ensure all stakeholders are consulted and why one of the defects or one of the inadequacies of the IT biodiversity target which I said earlier on did not we did not meet any fully was that when IT biodiversity target was adopted in 2010 for 2011 2020 it was expected that only governments were responsible for the uh, implementation of the 20 targets. But we can see here that, as I said, 
one country, one ministry cannot uh, do all the implementation. Biodiversity cuts across different sectors. We have mentioned biodiversity is agriculture, biodiversity is air, is water, is ocean. So it can't be just ministro, ministries of environment. So to, to fill that gap, the post 2020 framework, we have ensured and the co-chairs have ensured literally all stakeholders have been consulted. This extra time has provided us that opportunity. And if one looks at the, the the first draft of the framework, all stakeholders can see themselves in it. What does this mean? It means also when it is adopted next year at the next face-to-face -face, uh, conference of the parties, all stakeholders will be expected to play a role in its implementation. So it's not going to be implemented only by governments, but by private sector, by youth, by women, indigenous peoples, local communities, academicians, researchers, scientists, mention who, and they all have a role to play in that framework. So please, as the university, take an interest to look at it and tell us if you cannot see yourself there to be able to contribute to its implementation. And we can see also during the implementation of the Aichi targets, private sector, was least involved in the last 10 years. The last two weeks in uh, Glasgow, we can see how the private sector, the banks, uh, the corporate bodies, the uh, corporate institution, financial institutions, making pledges ready to uh, contribute to the preservation and restoration of biodiversity through the uh, contributing to deforestation, to uh, afforestation, to land use, and what have you. So we have all now been engaged, and we hope the implementation will be the same. And this is the opportunity uh, the lockdown has provided us in terms of holding uh, virtual meetings and many uh, uh, in terms of preparing moving forward. And we hope the negotiations in January which will include the SABSTA, the scientific subsidiary body, the implementation subsidiary body, and the open-ended working group on the post-2020 framework, all in January for two and a half, three weeks. Uh, we, the online uh, engagement will have facilitated those negotiations to, to, to progress. Next slide. Ah, okay, I think I've covered that. Let's continue. Probably on the previous one, what I can say is, although I say that we have been able to meet uh, virtually, for many countries, it has not been easy. We have concerns being raised by many countries in terms of lack of secure and stable internet connections, and also the lack of interaction. I mean, human beings, and especially when it comes to negotiations, uh, those who are familiar with negotiations, negotiations cannot take place in big room of 100 people. It is in the corridors, it is on the coffee stations, it is in the receptions, and by the time you meet as 100, it's just the gavel going down. So that has been a major defect. Intercon uh, internet connections had been an issue. We actually had to take different steps to support particularly participants in developing countries to be able to participate in the virtual meetings through support in increasing their internet bandwidth, through uh, creating bubble, uh, uh, through bubble approach, bringing and negotiators uh, from, from one country into one venue in a hotel with proper internet connection. So as a country delegations, they can meet together, consult each other and participate with the rest of the world virtually. Or situation where 
from one region, all the delegates are moved to one country, they have been put in one hotel, and therefore, as a region, they are able to then consult each other and build the regional positions for negotiations. So that has been a major concern, and we managed to deal with that, not necessarily to the satisfaction of all, but we hope to bridge all those gaps when we meet uh, in, um, in January face to face. So what has been the role of uh, environmental law in, pro in the protection and safeguarding of the environment, particularly when it comes to regulating uh, activities which have adverse impacts on the environment. Next slide. Yes. What one would have observed, literally most of the international treaties related to environment have provisions related to human health, protection of nature, protection of the environment. Whether you are looking at climate change, Paris Agreement, our own biodiversity and the protocols, whether you are looking at CMS migratory species, international trade on endangered species, Ramsar on wetlands, desertification, the chemicals conventions, Rotterdam, Stockholm, Minamata on mercury, persistent organic pollutants, and uh, uh, <clears throat> persistent and prior informed uh, consent, the chemicals and the uh, transboundary movement of hazardous waste, to, uh, the buzzer, or the agricultural one, the IPPC, the Plant Protection Convention, and the Treaty on Agriculture and Food, Food and Agriculture, all have specific provisions related to uh, uh, safeguarding human health. I may give an example. If you look at uh, climate, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, it says in the preamble that it aims at protecting the planet from the threat of climate change. That's a uh, Paris Agreement and climate. The ozone, it seems I did not list above, but there's also the ozone regime, the ozone Vienna Convention on the uh, ozone depleting substances and the Montreal Protocol. So the ozone regime, it, end, it in, aims to protect us human beings from dangerous effects of the depletion of the ozone layer in the atmosphere. When you look at uh, CBD and the protocols and other biodiversity related conventions I mentioned at the very beginning, they work towards the protection of wildlife, ecosystems, and ensuring sustainable use. When you look at CITES, it regulates international wildlife trade. Even if we go further looking at the uh, general agreements on trade and tra uh, tariffs, contains provisions related to the impact of trade on the environment. When you look at the combat desertification, it aims at avoiding, minimizing, reversing desertification and land degradation and mitigating the effects of drought in affected areas. So all these, and when you look at the chemicals, one, preventing pollution from hazardous waste, chemicals, persistent organic pollutants, mercury. So all these are looking at protecting all that so that our human health is well, are well protected. And these international treaties are also complemented by many regional conventions, as well as even national uh, legislation. Next slide. Oh, so those are some of the treaties which I've mentioned. Uh, and yes, climate change, you go to Article 1, it talks of changes on human health and welfare are considered as adverse effects of climate change. When you go to Paris Agreement in its preamble, 
It says, acknowledges climate change as a common concern of humankind. And climate change, it intends to address climate change, respect and promote respective obligations on the right to health. When you look at the Vienna Convention on Ozone Layer, it talks of potentially harmful impacts of human health and the environmental modification of the ozone layer. Montreal Protocol talks of protection of human health and the environment and recognizes that certain substances can significantly deplete uh, the ozone layer. Our convention, it talks of sustainable use of biological diversity are of critical importance to me for meeting food, health, and other needs of growing population. So, I mean, these are just few examples, but all these conventions have provisions dealing with human health. And this is the connection between biodiversity, human health, and environmental law. So the laws at international level have taken that cognizance at uh, hand. All chemical instruments, the four, are talking of parties are aware of the risk of damages to human health and the environment caused by hazardous waste and other waste, pesticides, persistent organic pollutants, and mercury. So we can see how uh, human health and therefore biodiversity is fundamental uh, as a foundation of our human health. Next slide. Before I, in the context again of environmental law and uh, human health, the convention secretariat has been working closely with the World Health Organization. Fortunately, even before the COVID, you cannot believe it. In 2018, our COP14 had actually adopted a guidance document on biodiversity inclusive One Health guidance. And this guidance basically provide guidelines on how we can prevent disasters like pandemics caused either by human or animals as the COVID we are in place. This was 2018 and 2020, we all went down. So this guidance, which many uh, countries had not begun uh, absorbing it, became very uh, important. And that has been built through our collaborative cooperation between the Secretariat and the World Health Organization in terms of, again, looking at biodiversity and health as one whole. And we have a joint program therefore looking at biodiversity and One Health. And you will see in our fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, which had reviewed the status of the, uh, whether we had met the IH biodiversity targets or not. With all the recommendations made, the last one which brought all the recommendation into one hall was we need to move to whole of government and whole of society approach in dealing with environmental issues generally, not just biodiversity, not health. What we also call one health approach. One health approach is whole of government, whole of society approach, whereby at national level, all government, social, economic, environmental development or departments of government meet together to decide on uh, issues related to which will help us into the one health. Because when we, when the health of human beings, when we fall sick, it is the medical bill which increases because our health are poor. And why our, our health is poor? Either it is the normal diseases which we are told to take care of our health because of the choices of our diets, pressure, diabetes, heart attack, and what have you. So if we take care of our health, and this is where we come into 
uh, when we look at the food systems, the agricultural production, the human being, the choices of our diets. What do we choose to eat? What will be health? Where is it coming from? Is it from sustainable agriculture or we don't care? And all this makes this one circle. So if we look at everything as one health approach, then we'll begin filling the dots from where the food is coming from, where it is farmed, how it is transported, how it reaches the market, how do I choose my, what type of food to eat, how much I reduce the waste, to what I eat, to avoid us going to the hospitals and therefore reducing the government's bill on medication. So one health approach, and that has been the essence of our collaboration with the, the World Healthy Organization. Next slide. It is the same, uh, basically underlining that the environmental law I've talked about is well complemented uh, by healthy law laws. And when we talk of healthy laws, we are looking at the public health in terms of risk, limiting our interference with the international traffic and trade, which may have caused us with the COVID and how to respond to that, but also the animal health. We have our pets, we have our cats, we have the animal husbandry. So how do, uh, how do we deal with introduction of diseases, zoonotics, pathogens, uh, uh, not to make us suffer again? So again, is a, uh, there is major complementarity between environmental law and healthy law and our work with health organization and organization for animal health. Next slide. So how do we protect ourselves moving forward as I come towards the end? And I think many things I've mentioned, COVID-19 is not just a healthy issue. Of course, now people had to rush to the hospital. We have all gone into vaccination, being vaccinated, being locked in. But now we see it is a de development crisis. All countries have suffered both socially, economically, environmentally, but also development. So <clears throat> there is a need to transform our development model into what I've said, whole of government, whole of society, integrated holistic approaches in looking at development issues. Our treasury ministries of finance should not only look at money to go to where they think this is development and therefore environment is not important. This is the cost we are paying. Clearly, business as usual is no longer an option. If we are thinking is an option, then we are saying we are ready for worse pandemics than what we have seen. So clearly we cannot return to the normal we knew. We need to be, build back better. <clears throat> and therefore we need to look at greener economic recovery, greener jobs, sustainable growth, uh, movement of financial flows from neg nature negative outcomes to nature positive outcomes. We need to shift, <clears throat> repurpose and redirect the $500 trillion spent every year as incentives to harmful subsidies to fossil fuel into nature positive activities. I said earlier on, 50% of the global GDP is dependent on nature. <clears throat> so there are opportunities on nature, but nature can only pay us back if we protect it. If the soil is not protected, continues to be degraded and choked with pesticides and hazardous chemicals, it cannot produce the food which will be <clears throat> sustainable for our health. So we need all actors, and this is where the private sector comes in to also understand the risks 
the impacts and their dependencies of the activities on nature to be able to manage the risk, to manage the impacts, but also use the opportunity and actually account and report on those dependencies. And this is where we hope the post 2020 global biodiversity framework being negotiated will help to build this reconstruction following the pandemic when we come to implementation. We hope this framework will play a key role in building resilience we need in the face of this growing healthy environmental and development challenges. Next slide. Elizabeth, so, if we could finish in, in within five minutes, please. Yes, I will Thank be you. there. Indeed. Few words on the framework, since this is what is going on now. It is the framework for the next 10 years aligned with 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, aiming to reach our long-term vision in 2050, living in harmony with nature. It proposes uh, uh, a number of currently 21 specific targets, measurable targets with percentages, with numbers, which again is filling the gap from the Aichi biodiversity targets. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. I think I've been to referred to that. So some conclusions. Environmental law truly is developed today than before. We have a rich body of legal frameworks which exist at all levels. We are not short of international treaties, regional treaties, national laws and regulations. What we are short of is their implementation and enforcement. This is what has led us to, if we are talking of uh, maybe COVID uh, interfering with the animal kingdom, wildlife management laws not fully uh, implemented, agricultural laws not fully implemented. So clearly implementation enforcement becomes key and we need the laws to be fully integrated into the and fully integrate the protection of human health as one of its objectives. So that is uh, again key. And uh, we need to see that, as I said, really implementation enforcement challenges is the main reason. We need the political will, we need the commitment, we need the expertise, we need the technical support, we need the financial resources. Again, implementation and enforcement. Next slide. So looking ahead, we focus on implementation and enforcement of what we have and developing new treaties as many will be, can be suggesting is not a solution. We need to focus on collaborative, holistic, integrated, overarching one health approach, bringing in whole of government, whole of society with all stakeholders engagement. And this is what will ensure an effective implementation of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So last slide. If we take care of nature, obviously nature will take care of us. And therefore, all actions are really needed today and not tomorrow. Transformative change on our relationship, human relationship with nature. COVID is a stark reminder of what human actions have done on nature. I don't think we want to go back. Business as usual is not a solution. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Elizabeth Moreira. Uh, wonderful uh, tour de force. 
uh, of uh, biodiversity uh, conservation, not only under the uh, Biodiversity uh, Convention, uh, but also uh, more generally. Now we have a, um, a few questions uh, which have been uh, picked up. And so I'll just uh, flag the, the topics and then I'll, I'll give them um, more particularly. Uh, so the first uh, concerns the uh, involvement of um, all voices, so particularly Indigenous and local communities in uh, the solution uh, to biodiversity uh, conservation and protection. So that's something we're learning from the, uh, the COVID pandemic is that we, we need to uh, broaden the knowledges that are, are coming in. The second one uh, is really how do we sort of learn from what we've done before? So for example, under Aichi, there were various biodiversity targets uh, set for 2020. And of course, we, we haven't met all those. Uh, and uh, what under the global uh, biodiversity framework, uh, what uh, can, lessons can we learn from the past uh, to do better in the future? I'll come to those more particular questions in a moment. And, and the third uh, concerns uh, finance. And so uh, has the, the lack of of sufficient uh, finance for biodiversity conservation um, during uh, COVID particularly uh, increased the, the impact of biodiversity. So those are the topics, just to give you the heads up. And now I'll come to um, put the questions more directly. So the first one was from uh, Dr. Judith Preston and was this, uh, what is the proportion of members from the Global South, and particularly Indigenous and local communities uh, on uh, CBD bodies and committees about which you spoke, uh, including the ad hoc committees, uh, to ensure that their voices are heard and their knowledges are used in relation to biodiversity protection. So that was the first and I'll come to the others later. Thank you very much. Actually, in our convention, unlike all other conventions, uh, all the ones I've mentioned, we have a fully pledged program including uh, a trust fund for indigenous peoples and local communities. So they are involved in all our processes. Uh, they are engaged, they meet on their own and their recommendations being brought in to the different bodies. So in, in addition to this program on indigenous peoples and local communities and their funding for that purpose, we also, what I've mentioned, Article 8J Traditional Knowledge Working Group, which again, indigenous peoples and local communities are heavily involved. This is their body, it is their working group, and their recommendations from there feed into uh, the Substar Scientific, Technical, and Technological Advice subsidiary body, as well as the implementation. So they are fully engaged, they are fully supported, and they have an opportunity also to speak at all our meetings. Okay. And the second uh, question from Dr. Michelle Lim, and these are, as I said, questions about how do we achieve the transformative change that really is needed, um, including under the global biodiversity framework. So the first question was uh, if you could elaborate on the enforcement and implementation mechanisms under the global biodiversity framework. And so how do we learn uh, from the lessons of Aichi? Um, and then the second question uh, is, what's the current state of negotiations about holding uh, countries legally accountable uh, during the term of that uh, framework, the global biodiversity framework? And the third question, I'm giving all of these because I think they interrelate, uh, will there be any extension of time to implement the framework? Uh, is it still a 2030 timeframe by which states are aiming to achieve the targets? Thank you. <clears throat> what have we learned from IT targets? I think I've mentioned one engagement of all stakeholders, I mean, engagement of all stakeholders and that this extended period because of the COVID has enabled to engage all stakeholders and consult them in different groups. And that still continues. One. Uh, two, I've mentioned uh, the expectation of IT targets that was left to the ministries of environment for the implementation. Biodiversity cannot be implemented by one ministry. So that's why we are saying now 
all stakeholders because we have engaged all of them and they have contributed to the draft framework. They can see themselves already on the draft framework. We hope then they will also engage in the participation. Aichi Biodiversity Target had also missed the monitoring accountability review mechanism. Uh, and therefore, until after 10 years, then we came and say, oh my God, all the 10 years have lapsed. We have not met any of the targets. This time, the framework will be adopted with, a, uh, it will come with a package. And one of which will be uh, the review accountability monitoring framework uh, mechanism as part of the negotiation package. It will include a capacity building action plan. It will include resource mobilization strategy. It will include gender action plan for its implementation. So all this will be a package of the framework to be adopted, again, learning uh, from the Aichi targets. One, the Aichi target, yes, we are talking, it was a decade, 10 years, in actual fact, in practic practice, it was half a target. Why? Many countries, when, when the Aichi biodiversity targets were adopted in 2010, took a step back and began the process of updating, reviewing, and developing national biodiversity action plans, uh, biodiversity strategies and action plans, NBSAPs. And this is a national consultative process, which for many countries took four to five years to complete, and then now began implementation. As the result, yes, we took stock of 10 years, but actual implementation was half of it. This time, what we are saying, all countries, 185 countries, have NBSAPs already in place. And because the framework is building upon from the Aichi biodiversity targets, we are saying that the NBSAPs are already a useful tool to begin implementation so that implementation can begin immediately when the framework is adopted, as opposed to taking a step back. To support that, at the first part of the, our COP15 last month, Global Environmental Facility, Jeff, finding mechanism of the convention, together with the UN Environment Program and UN Development Program, UNDP, in partnership, they have agreed to fast track developing countries and begin to prepare help them to begin preparing from now so that by the time the framework is adopted, they can hit the road and run. So again, this is the support which has come in handy to avoid the delays at the time of the IT targets. One, two, uh, what we are saying, if the NB subs will need to be reviewed or updated, it will be done as implementation continues. And probably the only part major part which might need to be adopt, adopted is when the countries identify national commitments. Uh, uh, and this will, or national targets rather, or national commitments, national targets. One weakness of the IH biodiversity targets, you find at national level, some countries has actually, had actually made progress more than what was required at international level. But their national targets were not aligned with the global goals, global targets. And when we look at the assessment, we are looking at global goals. So we hope that will be now this lesson that the countries will need to align their global goals with the, uh, their national goals with the national, with the global goals. What is the time period? Yes, uh, the, the years have been reduced, but we are still looking at 2030 because the framework will also contribute to a number of the targets and indicators of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, when you look at the 17 SDGs, 14 of them require contribution from biodiversity nature. So that's also part of the alignment that as countries implement or fulfill their obligations under SDGs, they will also be 
implementing targets of the uh, framework, biodiversity framework and vice versa. So the period is still that, but for the framework, we are taking it as a short term because the framework continues to the long term 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. So the first benchmark will be 2030 and then uh, will be updated and we continue. Current status, I mentioned the first draft is out since July. Country parties have looked at it through virtual meeting, meet, meetings. There will be formal negotiations in January uh, in Geneva for three weeks, uh, both for the subsidiary bodies as well as the working group on the framework. We hope that will make major progress before final negotiations at the conference of the parties uh, scheduled now end of April, May for its adoption. I hope I quickly responded yeah. to those. Okay, thank you. Now, the uh, quickly, because um, we don't have a lot more time, there's a couple of more questions I want to pick up. Um, just anything on uh, finance? Uh, there's a couple of general questions about uh, finance and whether that is uh, hampering efforts to uh, conserve biodiversity globally. Finance have hampered, I mentioned where uh, there had been an increase of poaching because of less resources, one going to wildlife management, but also that those who were protecting had also to go indoors because of the COVID. And this gave room for the poachers to celebrate. So there had been, of course, that impact. Uh, in terms of negotiations, not so much because we move the discussions into online, which is less costly than when we meet face to face. So as far as the process is concerned, we have gained a lot because of this extended, extended period. Uh, in terms of implementation, uh, delighted at the first uh, COP last month, China has established biodiversity fund and already put in $230 million to it, inviting other countries to contribute. Japan, which had established a biodiversity fund during the IH biodiversity targets, it is extended its fund with an additional $17 million. So we had quite a number of pledges uh, for the uh, implementation on bio of biodiversity agenda. European Union announced its doubling its funding on biodiversity. Uh, France, 30% of climate fund will go to biodiversity. His Royal Highness Prince Charles announced also percentage of climate fund going to biodiversity. Again, seeing the connection between changes in climate and biodiversity. So fingers crossed, more and more of these commitments will continue to flow uh, as we move in to the actual face-to-face uh, -face COP later next year. Good, thank you. Right, now different, um, we had an earlier question about involvement of different voices uh, from indigenous and local communities. We've got another question from Dr. Michelle Maloney uh, about whether you see any role for earth-centered laws, uh, such as rights of nature or indigenous uh, First Nations laws, in transforming what we would think as sort of Western biodiversity law. So what is the conventional you know, international law and domestic laws that we have? Uh, I don't think I have the accurate answer there uh, because what the Secretariat does provides platform for the indigenous peoples and local communities to discuss issues of their common interest and to give them platform also to share those views and recommendations with the different processes, uh, including to the COP. So unless within that uh, platform, they bring the issues of First Nation laws and the like, which I do not recall so far. Good, now I think that I have to make this the last question, but uh, it from Jackson Bradney, uh, and it really is looking for some good news stories. Uh, so what are some projects that provoke, promote biodiversity conservation that you're hopeful uh, to see um, come to fruition in the coming years? So uh, we could finish then on uh, a, an upbeat uh, message. 
but if I say which project, then you are telling me to begin peri picking. <laughs> no, no, it's not to get into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> as long as a project contributes to the protection, conservation, restoration of biodiversity, then we are delighted. And you know, the size of the project will also depend with the size of the problem or the size of the beneficiaries of that particular project. So, and each country is unique, is different, and we'll have different types of projects and also different priorities on the same biodiversity issues. All right. Um, then uh, perhaps I can get well in one because some people have been asking about implementation and enforcement. Uh, so primarily, of course, that's uh, done in each domestic jurisdiction. Uh, insofar as they implemented it, uh, the, the convention, uh, they have to uh, enforce their own laws. But uh, what are the implementation enforcement mechanisms that you see uh, to be working uh, under the CBD? You see, the question of implementation and enforcement is left entirely within the jurisdiction of the national governments or the parties in our case. And where there is non-compliance, this is where, for instance, the protocols have established committees to help parties which are non-compliant and to provide the needed assistance to be able to bring them into compliance. But even our compliance committees in the protocols, they are still fairly new. So they are not yet, I would say, really specific best practices one can share. But there are best practices in other treaties. And for instance, if I may give an example of climate change, under climate change, they've established a fully fledged compliance mechanism, which include both a facilitative mechanism and a sanction mechanism. CITES also has that mechanism, whereby if the country does not comply, then it gets into trade sanction. But again, we need to remember, for biodiversity, if you put those sanctions, it, it is biodiversity which will suffer. While where you put sanction on countries not to, to trade on particular animal species or plants, then the economy of the country suffers. And that's where the countries will go out of their way to make sure they get back into compliance, not to uh, face the sanction. So we need to look at that differences. For biodiversity, we need to be careful. So we can only play with a facilitative role for non-compliance as opposed to the sanction measures which other conventions have done successfully. Well, I think I'd better bring this. Um, there's lots of questions, so you've generated a lot of interest, and that's uh, wonderful, and it's testament uh, to your, your knowledge and skill. So thank you very much uh, for the uh, presentation. Um, now, I'm not quite sure that, but um, Professor Nengilu, uh, would you uh, conclude the, the matter? So I'll yeah. pass it back to you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you so much, Elizabeth, for uh, delivering this. I hope these questions can be compiled and shared, just to have a feel of which questions. Yeah, we will, we will, and for your fascinating and comprehensive uh, presentation about the impact of COVID-19 on the international environmental governance and the biodiversity conservation. I think there is no doubt that this is a imminent issue. Uh, there are lots of concerns. There are lots of work to do, but also we have hope. So I think uh, the Center for Imam the Law, uh, our research agenda is fully aligned with what the message you have delivered today. So uh, with this, I uh, conclude, conclude this year's annual lecture. I'd like to also thank our Dean, uh, Professor Liz Fisher, uh, Justice Brian Preston, and also our, our guests from uh, all over the place uh, across the globe to John uh, Elizabeth for this wonderful event. And the recording will be available and to everyone who registered and we will compile all the questions so and our dialogue so our event will end here but our dialogue between the law and nature will continue uh, so thank you once again everyone and we look forward to seeing you in our future events thank you thank you bye thank you very much for the privilege to share these few thoughts thank you thank you